For most Americans, this is the lasting image of Soviet hockey. One magical moment when a group of college kids achieved the unthinkable. They beat the Soviets. The game had less to do with ice wars than the Cold War, a battle between bitter enemies. Now, it's a different world. Russians and Americans on the same team. There are 52 Russians in the National Hockey League today. They left home for the promise of freedom, prosperity, and a better life. Many left with a belief that they would never return. Welcome to Moscow. Hi, I'm Mike Milbury. I've seen some amazing things in my 20 years in professional hockey, but nothing quite like I've seen on this trip. Five years after the first Russian players left for North America in careers in the NHL, they've come home, and we've come with them. They've shown us their hometowns and given us an inside look at the system that produced them, a system which ultimately demanded too much from them. This is their story. In this country, all hockey roads lead to Moscow the center of the world's most demanding hockey system. The facilities make it even tougher. They're archaic. So the stuff we do have in the States is, is 10 times better. As you can see, the showers are quite different here. You turn the water on, and it sort of comes out in just a stream. That's a tough shower right there. The buildings may be falling apart, but the foundation of hockey has always been solid. Since the Soviets first appeared on the international scene in the late 1950s, they have dominated. Their success has been a result of a demanding training system. At the top level, players are given less than a month each year away from the game. Serious training begins at an early age. These children skate five days a week. No one tells them it's just a game. All coaches in Russia are paid professionals. No parent coaches here. A coach will stay with the same group from age six to 16. The ultimate goal once was a spot on one of only nine league clubs in the Soviet Union, and for the very best, a place on the national team. The price for that achievement was high, freedom. The system made you train three times a day because they feel like they owe you, and uh, I shouldn't say that, but you know, the, we didn't have a personal life. It's my, it's my first locker room. When I came from Lithuania, I started playing here. I was like uh, those guys here. And, uh, yeah, I have lots of memories because it was my first steps in hockey, you know? Steps that led Darius Kasparaitis to the New York Islanders, where he would battle the giants of the NHL. First, he had to fight his way to the top of the Soviet system. He left his home at 14 to join the KGB club, Moscow Dynamo. The first year was difficult, and he ran away from the club back to his home in Lithuania. His mother convinced him to return, knowing that staying in Moscow would be better for his future. I was crying for two, like, for two, two weeks, and after that, I just gave up. And gave in to the system. We used to spend here 11 months a year. And now it was like, it was like everything, house, our house, our, was our life here. It was for me like jail, you know? I was afraid, coach. You know, if I see coach over here, I just be quiet, you know, like a little bit. All guys was afraid of coach. If your coach catch you, you go out, and uh, I'll maybe catch you with a cigarette, I don't know. You can go in the army. Here we're working out, lifting weights, lifting weights in the summertime. Here we're playing tennis or little soccer games. kind of mess right now, you see. This is our locker room. It used to be nice here, nice and nice, nice and clean. Right now it's a little bit messed up. This stuff, you see? Here's my seat right here. I used to sit here. Best seat in the, in the house. Here's the Jamnov from Winnipeg Jets. Jamnov, Kavala. Now, Kovalev sit here. Kovalev from New York Rangers. You see me and Kovalev here together. 
Alex, Alex. Stand the cup, Shane. Did you happen to see their drying room and stuff like that, how they dry their equipment? You put your stuff, hockey stuff, it's hot, you see? And you put all your stuff, skates or... Take this and... Uh, with... Oh. When you take shower, you put like this. Put like this in the shower and you wash with a uh, soap. I want to see my room. Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit messed over there, you know. Coach, coach, one coach used to live here, and if you go late, you walk like this. Coach used to live here, and you go quiet. Yeah, it's still all right. It's my room. It's still my stuff here, you know. Look, oh my God, it's my stuff, you know. The stuff, all the stuff, Viking cuff. My bath right here. I used to sleep here. And all this, I did this stuff. I did this car, hockey cars. You see? Kasparitis now has his own NHL card. It's his first visit home in three years. There have been some pleasant memories, but this trip has also reminded him of why he left. Okay, in this country, you need to be quiet, you know? You just shut your mouth and just do your work. I feel lucky, yeah. I feel lucky because when I take on a bus with team to the practice or to the game, and I saw I see people on the streets, and you know, I just feel lucky because I have life. I have a good life right now, you know, and thanks God for that. You know. Recently, Darius took a close look at his life. He realized he can no longer hide from a drinking problem. His problem is now under control in the United States, at least. In Russia, he's not sure. And I, I think if I stay in this country, I, maybe I can, I gonna still, I gonna start drinking again. I think, because it's so, it's so depressed here. You know, it's nothing to do, and uh, just no, no future in this country. And I'm telling myself right now, like I never come back anymore in this country. Never, 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 never. Stay with us. Up next, you risked everything for freedom. Slava Fatisov's battle with the system. Dynasties, the glory of American sports. But for sheer dominance, no American team can match the Soviet Union's Central Red Army Club. For the last two decades, one man has ruled over that dynasty, Viktor Tikhonov. He also coached the national team and had help from the Army in recruiting the best players. If a player refused to play for him, he was drafted into the military and assigned to General Tikhonov. It was a lifetime assignment until one player fought to change things. Perhaps you've heard his name. Fatisov shot, save, score! Vacheslav Fatisov, one of the first players from the former Soviet Union to join the NHL. He played 13 years for his country and Viktor Tikhonov. As captain of both the national team and the Central Red Army team, he was well decorated throughout the 80s. Two Olympic gold medals, eight world championships, 13 straight Soviet titles. He was one of the world's top defensemen. He had everything except his freedom. You want to buy furniture, you want to buy a refrigerator, you want to buy a set of TV, you know. Everything depends on the coach because he's, a, you know, your boss. Tikhonov, Fatisov grew to hate him and the control he had over players' lives. Without his permission, you cannot buy a car. And you go for him, hey, Victor, you know, I need a car, you know, it's my car is broke, you know, it's look at this. No, 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 you, you know, you're not good for me, you know, you have to be better. Players lived year-round in dormitories. Tikhonov held the key. Without his permission, they couldn't even visit their families. We give up everything that we had. You know, uh, private life, you know, it's the uh, best time in life. I mean, from 20 to 30 years old. Russian life has always been hard, even for a promising young hockey player. Practicing six days a week, up to four times a day, is excessive. Under Tikhonov, it was expected. I think law and order is very important. Discipline is very important. All the great players want to play for Tikhonov and the Central Red Army. Fetisov played for other reasons. He was proud uh, to the play for the country. He was so proud when our flag was raised up in you know, any competition. As early as 1984, after winning his first Olympic gold medal, 
even national pride wasn't enough. When his teammate and good friend Vladislav Tretiak retired, Fetisov took a look at his own future. He saw how other players were treated when their careers were over. It made him wonder. As soon as you stop playing, you threw out, and you know, you're alone. You're alone, you have no, uh, no job, you have no profession. All your life, what you did to play hockey. The Soviet athlete was constructed to be a robot, designed to win. No emotions, no personal life, no family, only one goal, victory. Tikhonov demanded it. According to some players from the former Soviet Union, they were often given drug injections before games. If a player, like Fetisov, refused, he faced punishment. I don't know how to say it, but... He's put a knife in your back any time. The final straw came during the 1988 Olympics. Fetisov witnessed Tikhonov punch a teammate. His team had already clinched the gold medal. The game was meaningless. The player, Alexander Mogilny. Fetisov wanted out and said so publicly. It was a very tough situation. I lost all my friends during the, those period of time. And, you know, it's, uh, I was fighting against a uh, big system, communist system. He was stripped of his spot on the national team. But the bigger loss was his defense partner and best friend, Alexei Kasatanov. He was my brother. You know, it's, uh, we start together, we play together, we live in the same room. It was, it was a critical situation in my life. But, you know, Alex take, uh, took position, uh, taken off position. But he was not completely alone. Three others on his unit took his side. Igor Larionov, Vladimir Krutov, and Sergei Makarov went on national television and gave Tikhonov an ultimatum. The famed KLM line would not play in the upcoming world championships without their captain. For the first time, Viktor Tikhonov backed down. Finally, after leading his team to yet another world championship, Fetisov was given his release to the NHL. Younger players like Pavel Bure watched in awe. They knew their futures were also at stake. At the time, he could only stand by him, offering silent support. Today, they are still side by side, and Bore wishes he could have done more. I'm just one maybe missing because I couldn't help him at that time because I was so young. Fetisov's battle was his own, but his victory was shared. He opened a door, a door that Bore and Kasparitis and dozens of others would later use, a door to freedom. When we come back, he deserted his country and his army. He was a wanted criminal. Now, for the first time in almost six years, Alexander Mogilny goes home. If you play ice, roller, or street hockey, then check out this special offer from Hockey Player, the magazine for those who play. Each issue is packed with what you need to get the most out of playing the world's fastest team sport. Interviews with NHL stars and coaches, playing tips from the pros, equipment reviews, conditioning drills, new products, and more. Dial 1-800-652-0101 to subscribe. Order with Visa or MasterCard and receive your free bonus gift, 101 Hockey Tips. This booklet is a must-have source of winning edge hockey secrets. Subscribe to Hockey Player and improve every aspect of your game with special columns and departments for goalies, defensemen, forwards, coaches, and more. So whether you play on the ice or in the street, call 1-800-652-0101 and get ready to score. To subscribe, call 1-800-652-0101. A year subscription of 10 issues is only $15.95. Order now with Visa or MasterCard and receive your free gift, 101 Hockey Tips. That's 1-800-652-0101. Society says beating on things is unacceptable behavior, except in the ring. Everyone wants to know what it's like, how it feels, where it comes from. A blow to the head, white flash, and a ringing sound in your ears. Welcome to the dark side. It's an interesting place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. That's why I box. something Alexander Mogilny has done before. He grew up in a Riverport town in Siberia. 
feeling the government's control everywhere. I'm Catholic, you know, uh, I'm, you know, yeah. But when I was growing up, everything was kind of against the law. When he was just 15, he left home for Moscow for the celebrated Red Army Club. I didn't want to go back because it wasn't very much over there, back there for me, you know, and uh, anything was better than there, really, because I didn't want to make a step backward. He loved the hockey, but hated the system. Hated that when his mother traveled more than 4,000 miles to visit, Tikhonov wouldn't allow Alex to see her. Mogilny saw a future of continued emotional and physical abuse, a life that older players like Slava Fetisov had already endured for more than a decade. I was among those players who had uh, been treated like that, and I was, I was looking up to those players, and I saw myself in their shoes in 10, 15 years from then, and I said, no, that's not me. I can't do that. I can't go through that. That's a waste of life. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything in this town. I didn't have family, personal life, nothing. That's probably pushed me over the edge, and I said, I had enough. It pushed him to make the most important decision of his life. Hey, goodbye. I gotta go. In 1989, Mogilny escaped the system. He deserted the Red Army, the first Soviet athlete to defect in 45 years. He was a criminal, convicted in absentia of treason. In America, he was free, a star, the first Russian captain in the NHL. This was his home now. For years, he believed he could never return to Russia. Or would he? Today, Alexander's homeland has changed. The Soviet Union is gone. Was there a chance that Mogilny, a defector, could return? Someday I had to come back here, because this is my home, home country. It was very scary at first, but my heart and soul told me that my child will come back in spite of everything, and all of it came true. But my soul also told me that the child will also come back to his home. In November, a break developed. Former Soviet players, now in the NHL, were going back home for an exhibition series. Alexander wondered, should he go too? He was technically still a wanted man. What if authorities arrested him getting off the plane? He made a tough choice. He went. I didn't know what to expect. I was really nervous. To be honest, really, I just, I didn't know what to expect. Because it's been almost six years. This is just how nervous the players were. They started the tour with bodyguards. The authorities were there all night, but to welcome, not arrest them. Reporters couldn't wait to hear what they had to say. The NHL All-Stars brought a gift Russian hockey fans loved, the reunited line of Pavel Bure, Sergei Fedorov, and Alexander Mogilny, three of the best who left on their own terms. There were gifts and banquets and receptions and more gifts and ceremonies and still more gifts even president yeltsin came to greet them the players were back and they were welcome they are worthy of returning as heroes back to their homeland and play together it's a beautiful people here you know they've been suffering for 75 years you know under the communist communist regime you know and uh, that's probably why but they, uh, they got so much warm in their heart. It came full circle at their very first game. Alexander, the goal scorer for the medal-winning 88 Olympic team, one of the first to flee the Soviet system, scored the first goal of the homecoming series. He had returned home. I feel like I opened another door ahead of me, so I can go there anytime I want and be welcome. Up next, we'll go home with Igor Laryana to see how small-town hockey in Russia is surviving tonight. salary last forever how can I be a worthy mother when all I want is my children's cereal Kellogg's frosted flakes just for kids brave adults say no my wife said she'd do anything to help 
How did he get me a spoon? Now more than ever, these adults are stepping forward to admit they love that sweet, delicious crunch. My passion finally led to a marriage of convenience. He's a milkman. Come on, give in. Frosted Flakes have the taste adults have grown to love. They're great! Rule number 61, icing the puck. Rule number 24, dangerous equipment. Rule number 47, charging. Rule number 25, to play the game, use a puck. The Sharks and the Blues take to the ice, Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern. The NHL rules on ESPN2. Igor Larionov is best known in North America for his performance last season. He led the San Jose Sharks to the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. In Voskresensk, where he grew up, he's known as one of the world's greatest players. He left for Moscow as a young man to join the Red Army in national teams. Alongside Vladimir Krutov and Sergei Makarov, he played on one of the best lines in hockey history. In 1989, he joined the Vancouver Canucks, leaving home for good. It's been 15 years since I've been gone. So this is it. This is the place you called home? Yeah. And you were where? Sixth floor? Sixth you floor. Me? Humble, yes, but home. And only a stroll from his school and across the street from his first ice rink, where he really lived. In 15 years, not much has changed. Okay. Same smell. <laughs> just, the, just the smell. On the outdoor rink where Igor played as a boy, the children still play pickup games early in the season. I've been playing the same same way. I guess they they can wait to get uh, natural ice, you know, or to find a real net, just like when Igor was young. If you're not in America, in the Soviet Union, it was about 20 years ago. So we didn't have anything. We didn't have uh, sports stores to sell in the hockey nets for the kids to play street hockey. So you have to create your own net. Equipment is still scarce. Skates are passed on from one boy to the next until they can no longer be laced. Face masks and uniforms are reused until they fall apart. Small city clubs, like Voskresensk, need more of everything. One answer was supposed to be NHL transfer fees for players like Larianov. And it's been about $1.2 million supposed to came from Vancouver for these kids. For, for the where sticks. Where they go? Nobody knows. Nobody gave me an answer. These children need the answer. And today, more than ever, the clubs desperately need money. Igor's father used to work at this Defense Department chemical plant. It sponsored hockey in this town. The end of the Cold War has changed that. Next year, they planning to close this, shut down this uh, plant, and 10,000 people will be out of job. In small Russian towns, local support must keep the teams alive. A difficult task when you consider the average Russian salary in these areas is about $50 a month. Democracy has yet to bring prosperity to these people except for the hockey player. Like a precious commodity, they are still produced in small towns like Igor's. They dress in closet-sized locker rooms and practice on dimly lit rinks, their pads and gloves older than their coaches. Off-ice training sets the Russians apart. The young goalie will spend hours training with nothing more than a tennis ball to perfect his skill. Hockey is still a window of opportunity here, a way to escape from a dreary life. You look around this country and you feel like you've gone back in time. While the rest of the world moved forward, Russia has moved in circles. Sometimes, man, it's really hard to explain to you guys, you know. You guys right now, you, you the witnesses what's going on in, uh, in reality because you, you can see your own eyes. Igor understands the reality that for a better future, these children will probably have to leave this country, just as he did. I would like to see these this people, and the Russian people, these kids, that have the same kind of life what I have right now. When we come back, we'll take a look at the future of Russian hockey. Okay, you're ready. You look great. Thanks, Lee. A few weeks ago, I was getting Eva ready for her close-up, and I noticed something. Dandruff. Regular shampoos just rinse flakes away. Head and shoulders helps prevent flakes from even forming. You see the difference? Head and shoulders, because great hair can't have flakes. Not rages from Reese's. Peanuts, milk chocolate, caramel, Reese's peanut butter. Not rages.
gorgeous. Mmm, give your mouth a party. Things in this country are broken. More than just a backboard or fence, or even the glass which litters the city rinks where children play. The system has been broken. This was the future of Russian hockey. Pavel Bure, Sergei Fedorov, Alexander Mogilny, three of the world's greatest players. But they left. The first of many to go to North America. The exodus has devastated a league which once rivaled the NHL. For the last five years, teams in Russia have struggled without them. This is a country where today, people sell their belongings in the street to survive. They can hardly afford a ticket to a game, even at a cost of just 40 cents. Without government financing, Russian clubs need other sources of revenue. That money has to stop going into the pockets of officials and start going where it belongs, to the children. They are the future of Russian hockey, and a large part of the future of the NHL. This may be the next Hart Trophy winner, or Stanley Cup champion. The Russians will always love this game. That will never change. Today, they are allowed to celebrate that passion. If you can imagine, Russians doing the wave. Major changes indeed. This is no longer a country in which the system controls the masses. Their futures are their own. There's an old Russian proverb. When a great forest is felled, splinters must fly. Political and economic splinters have been flying around this country for more than a decade now. But there's one thing I've come to realize about this place, and that's the strength of its people. People like Igor Larionov and Slava Fatisov. They're tough, they're determined, they're full of life. I think they'll find a way. They always have.